Hello everyone and welcome to the podcast. We're back again, back to doing two week episodes. Uh, this week I've got a guy who is a veteran, trains jiu-jitsu and has set up a, a kind of club that helps people with alcohol issues, um, substance abuse and, and uh, called Roll to Recovery. And uh, the whole premise is using jiu-jitsu as a, as a as a platform to kind of help people through their, their pathway of, uh, of recovery by doing that. So uh, without further ado, Michael Wheaton, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing, my friend? He is, mate. Yeah, good. I um I had to download Zoom again because every time, I think since lockdown, I just got rid of it. I, I stopped pretending that like Zoom was a thing. So having to set this up again was a it was a bit of fear, so <laughs> but yeah, mate, thanks for the invite. I'm I'm good, thank you. The um you know, I, I like Zoom. Um, it's 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 a pretty decent platform. I, I use it for a couple of my other businesses that I um that I have as well. So, um, you know, it, it helps people connect as well a little bit. You know, you, you can you can use other platforms. You know, uh, FaceTime and all that sort of stuff. But I just think it's I just think it's a good quality bit of kit because you can get your little whiteboard up and yeah, man. Uh, mate, let's uh, start right at the very beginning and stuff. So, like, you know, where did you grow up and uh, how did kind of the military thing come about? And did you used to try martial arts and stuff when you were younger too? Yeah, so um grew up in Durham, a small uh, county in the northeast. And um, the military thing, I think I started to fall out of love with school. And I think this is all part of the story, but... I think when I realized that like year nine, that this wasn't really me, I wasn't really going to go where the place, all the people were going to go, the kids were going, but I had no real way of like contributing. Like I didn't really know where I fit in, but I wasn't, I wasn't active. I wasn't sporty. I was like the, the weird little music kid in the back, you know, like with like three friends in the back who were like, just, just play guitar and look a bit weird where they wouldn't talk to anyone. Like that was me. So both parents were teachers and me mum. Uh, it was a teacher in the same school as me, and that led to all kinds of issues. There was, I was like, I was scrapping like every second day. There was so much like, I wouldn't call it bullying because it was like, well, yeah, it was a weird. That was a weird time, um, but because of that, um, I need to do something radical. You know, when you get the kind of A levels, and I knew. This this isn't for me. Like I can't go to uni. But I was scared to let my parents down. I thought my parents wanted me to be be that. So I tried to fulfill that kind of role for as long as I could until I knew I was gonna fail. I knew I was gonna pass my exams. And then I just walked down to Durham Cruise Office one day and met a bloke who changed my life. Um, you know, when you first I don't know if they still do cruise office. I, I don't know if they even still a thing anymore. I think I they still online. I think I think they are. Um are they? I, 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 I haven't went... seen one in so long. I mean, I, I I live down in um in Devon, so I don't think there's a careers office in Devon. I think the uh, where I live by Exeter in Exmouth, um, it's uh the close, I think the closest one one might be up in Bristol or something like that. Right, I well they, they were all over back then. So I joined in two thousand and four, um, and I remember walking down and uh, meeting the meeting one of these recruiters and looking at this bloke. I'm like. That's what I want to be like. That's the kind of that's the kind of bloke I want to be like. He was again. I'm going to blow this up because when you when you're tiny and young, like I was like 16, 17, this guy must he looked like six foot eight, just a just a bloke. And I was like, that's the kind of that's the kind of guy I want to be. And um, so my parents want me to get a trade. I didn't want to get a trade. And when I joined, he just pulled out this rubbish laminated map of the battlefields. Like, where do you want to be? on this battlefield like here they are there front line or the back and i was like well i think uh my parents want me to be at the back maybe you're doing something else and he's like you don't want to do that fuck that you want to be at the front i'm like okay yeah yeah still what to do and and then yeah that happened so then uh went infantry and i had to convince my parents just to sign the um not the early release what's it called we need your parental signature because i was i was 17 still and um then the whole army thing started, but that was that was a weird one because then all the kids, all the kids that I was like fearful of, I guess in school or had drawings with in school, all those same kids were were stood on day one right in front of us because they were all dropouts as well. I was like, oh no, 
like I ran away to the army to try and get away from this, and then I'm kind of re meeting these these same characters in the army. So how that all plays into the into the story to, to current day is um I worked really hard to become someone else. I didn't like who I was. I didn't know how that young kid contributed to anything outside of himself. So I remember making a kind of an agreement with myself to, to change everything about me. I wanted to be someone uh, someone different. And um and that worked for a period of time. Um did the whole thing, all the deployments, did Iraq, did Afghan. But then the fallout of that came and that's when like things went rapidly downhill. Um and everything that I'd believed or built up to believe about myself once I left. It was just like a game of kaplunk. Once that straw was pulled, everything came crashing down. And it wasn't immediate. It was a very slow burner. But yeah, that's that's when the whole rock bottom hit. And then rock bottom hit in different ways. For, oh, for years after I was out. And it's only recently I've got well, I'd say. Um, so I got out in 2011 after and then head fell off trying to join back up didn't get through best thing that happened thank god I didn't get back in um but then just just went off the rails for many years and uh you know all these years later kind of here i am trying to make someone new again trying to make a new character again and um, that's a very brief summary of me from 17 to 37 the uh the deployment side of things did did you find that played a um a kind of issue with kind of the mental health was it more the stuff that um you know I talk about this quite a lot especially with the conversations I have with with people because my my peer group now they're at the end of their um they're at their end of their time you know twenty two years twenty four years yeah you know some people get extended and you know try and stay on and live the dream um but. People use the military in a way as they, you get broken down, rebuilt again to kind of conform to this military machine. And then, you know, that becomes your identity. Mm -hmm. And um, if you don't have anything outside of that identity, then it can be really difficult to, to kind of, when you leave that, you know, try and find who you are. Uh, one of my friends actually, um, who I was on Herrick Five with back in 2006, 2006, mm -hmm. 2007. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's, uh, as soon as we finished there, he, he, um, he uh, transferred over to the New Zealand Navy and, you know, did a career down there, became a lieutenant commander. I had a oh. chat with him the other day and he's like, he's struggling with it because um, he, he really kind of doesn't in a way know who he is to a certain extent because of that identity. You know, he trains jujitsu He's a three strike, three strike blue belt. We used to surf together as well, you know, back in the day. And, you know, he said he stopped doing that because the crowds are so bad now, you know, it's only, well, it's a small Island, but it's not, um, you know, and, and finding that identity and, and trying to figure out who you are can be, can be a very, very, very difficult thing. And, yeah. Um, you know, without going down a massive rabbit hole with this, um, I've had quite a few friends like over the last few years kind of commit suicide due to the fact that they, they just can't find, I guess, in a way that, um, that anchor to stick themselves on, um, you know, which is kind of what happens really when you're put into extreme circumstances like war, for instance, you know, you get stuck into the thick of it, you've been shot at you've got these really high and low extreme kind of things. And then in a way that's kind of, I think why people probably try and stick into it because they're trying to find that next thing or, you know, um, that next fix, I guess. And uh, yeah, I know I just went off on one there, but <laughs> you know, did, no, did you find, did, 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 did that play a part with you too? Yeah, for sure. I don't think I experienced or continue to experience much trauma from the actual traumatic events of like conflict like i enjoyed it uh it was very enjoyable um very simple everyone says that right you know how your life works on a day-to-day -day basis out of our basis and that was a thrill and it was very simple it was very little else to deal with it's a lot of clarity there wasn't there it was like it was, it was easy to have clarity on operations because you knew exactly 
exactly how you contribute again. It was all about like, how do I fit in? And I understand exactly how I fit in there. But yeah, the trauma started once, once, I, once I got out. I just didn't, I, yeah. It's really strange looking back because I've only just finished processing it. It was so long ago. But the same thing, like I got to, uh, um, I've got similar stories with friends committing suicide. And and I got to a point where I wanted to to commit suicide, but I didn't want to go the same way they did because it was too quick. So I got in a in a, such a destructive cycle where I tried to kill myself really slowly. So I tried to take that many risks and do that much damage to myself that something else would take me out. I'd like, give me a disease, give me something fatal or something I can't control, something where I can shift the blame. You know, because I, I didn't want to do it so suddenly as, as, as quite a lot of my friends had done. Um, and that's how I led my life. I just, I went along taking risks um, in the hope that something would take me out because I didn't, I didn't want to be around for much longer. And I had, I had my little girl by this point. I've got two kids now, but at the point where I was thinking this, we had my little girl and I wanted to get, like I wanted to get out of there like before she got the chance to know me, to know me. Um, it's, it's weirder to think back to it now and it gets well emotional when I think about it. But it's it's funny to, to look back and have those thoughts. But I thought if I can get out of here early and then she won't need to grow up to like six years old, seven years old and see me. Because um, I felt contagious too. I didn't want to catch anything off me or like get 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 too close to me. I didn't know what was like happening to us. Um, yeah, and that's that's when the wheels are really falling off. But I don't think that, like you said, that wasn't from the the traumatic experience of conflicts. That wasn't a problem. It was it was the it was the sudden loss, the sudden loss of anchor that that identity. I, I couldn't deal with it. Couldn't deal with it. Um, so that's where the hard times came from for sure. I've I've been through quite an educational experience with this kind of thing, and um, you know I've had quite a lot of close friends commit suicide and and that sort of thing. And um, my uh, my wife she she's uh, she's doing a cognitive behavioural therapy degree now, but she also has been in the mental health space now in research within the NHS for you know the the, the last fifteen years. And my um you know. Don't be offended by what I'm just about to say. All right. Yeah. I always thought that when people kind of did that, it was it was kind of a coward's way out. Me too. Um, and when when people have done it, I'm like, well, you know, you've taken the easy option out of there. It's not you that's affected now because you're not here anymore. You know, it's the it's the other people that are connected to you. You know, your your dependents, your family the people that knew you, even, even the people that kind of like, I got affected by somebody um, I hadn't seen for, for, for a long time, but we were good friends, like, you know, back in the day. And, and uh, you know, he, he took his life and I was like, Jesus Christ, like, you know, what, what is going on? So it's not like the, you're you yourself that's um, affected by it. So I always felt that this, it's a very, um, it's a very selfish thing. Now, yeah. You know, it's taken me a long time and the education piece kind of slowly fed into me by my wife. It's kind of like, you know, it's it's not particularly selfish because the people that are in that situation, they feel like they have nowhere to go with it. Um, and uh, And that's why they're kind of there. But the interesting thing with this is that she did, um, at the tail end of COVID, she did triple one. Um, you know, the, the mental health line and um, what, she, what she kind of says to me a lot of the time is the people that say, uh, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to take loads of pills and all this sort of stuff. They're the people that are, this is a, a, a generalization. I'm not saying this is a hundred percent, you know, they're generally people that are not going to do it. That's a cry for help more than anything. It's the people that don't say anything, boom, it's gone. And that's generally. Just what, yeah. Yeah, I didn't want anyone to find me. I just want to just want to just disintegrate. If I could just disintegrate, happy days. Which, I don't want to make it. Yeah, yeah, which is which is completely crazy. And um, you know, I 
going down the selfish lungs, going to talk about me. Uh, you know, I've I did a lot of um, I did a lot of mental health courses. I did like all the uh, all the trim stuff. Um, yep. You know, when I was when I was in the Marines, and you know, I I physically went and did a few other advanced courses as well to to like trauma risk management and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, it wasn't again, it wasn't really kind of like to help other people where I, you know I kind of did. You know, I'm in the I'm in the position now where I, I run a holistic therapy business, and it's kind of like sometimes it's just I'm just there for an ear to cry on, you know, and uh, we, we, which is kind of cool. Um, you can use those use those processes to help people, um, yeah. but it was more for my own like mental health more than anything. Mm-hmm. And you know all the stuff that I'd seen. You know I've 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 done quite a few tours and I've been in some pretty horrific situations and um, you know all that sort of stuff that comes with it. Um, you know I kind of wanted to capture the the pieces that you know I, I wanted to try and catch it before anything kind of happened to me and you know touch wood nothing nothing really has and but i i firmly believe you know and this is kind of leading on to the jiu-jitsu thing now in and surfing is that i've got some some really cool anchors so i've been surfing since i was 14 i started jiu-jitsu what back in 2014 so 10 years now um, and, and they have kind of like been been my anchors behind everything. I think if I didn't I didn't necessarily have those, and I'd, I'd I'd definitely be struggling a little bit, which is kind of you know really cool. And in, in, in the thing that you know you're doing with with uh, with role to recovery because you know you're engaging with those people, not necessarily military, but all walks of life that can can kind of get pulled into that, and you can help them with it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's where that's out. That's where I'm up to. I think it's the same thing. It's like um, I think that half the half the battle with that was like I, I went to a wedding recently of me of my best mate's second wedding, um, and uh, it's the first time I've seen most of the blokes since uh, since Afghans so or Eric Seven, and uh, before it all kicked off the wedding, and everyone sat around a circle, and for some reason, everyone got something off the chest. How everyone's gone under. Every single person in the circle says, I fucking spanked in me. I compl-. But at the time, since we didn't talk because it was like, am I a burden? Am I the odd one out? A lot of shame was involved in it. No one said anything. But at the same time, everyone was going through it. Um, that was a wonderful moment. Totally unprovoked, totally unscripted. Everyone just felt the need to say something. And there were some people that weren't there because they didn't say anything. And they're, you know, they're no longer with us. But it was, it was a wonderful moment and a very sad moment at the same time. Um, something I still haven't really quite got to grips to because I still speak to a lot of the blokes who struggle with that on a daily basis as well. Well, I think, you know, like, so you know people, but people are able to do that now because it has, yeah. you know, mental health and all that sort of thing has become quite a, um, you know, a forefront in people's minds these days, especially like, you know, former military or you know, blue light services. Um, and, uh, you know, COVID did help with it. Yeah. Was it in a positive and a negative way you could technically argue because yeah. people are not kind of ash- not ashamed or, or they're yeah. not shy of, uh, you know, kind of expressing it, um, a, a little bit more. I think, I think the guys that, that probably would do a little bit more are the guys, the little bit of the more older school guys. So, you know, um, what well, I'm 42 now, so I'd probably say like you know 50s, a little bit older than that. They probably struggle a little bit more because they're a little bit at the tail end, older, older generation. I don't know what that generation's called now. Was it generation yeah, sure. something something? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, the, the, they they grew up in that kind of thing. Like everything was kind of internalized. Where we've grown up in a generation now where it's the 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 visualization of um, social media and and all, all these kind of things, you know, we get fired of us, at us and we can kind of take them in and, and process them, but also engage in that as, as well a little bit, which I think is a positive thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the yeah. jiu-jitsu thing, when did you start getting into uh, into martial arts? Oh, I reckon I started um, maybe seven years ago now. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, started at... Um, 
just my local one. There's one at Blackburn. It was a, it was like a hybrid kind of a Gracie Baja place, but wasn't just up from a gym. And it was actually the time when I was I was um I was weightlifting. I was I was doing a I think lifting and um the injuries I had were enormous to a point where I was like, what's missing in my training? I was like, well, everything on, that I do is on my feet. So I had no like desire to actually learn martial arts for any reason apart from the fact that nothing I did was on the ground. So I was like, what sport is on the ground? I don't do any crawling, any rolling, nothing. Like, how do I get on the ground? Um, and that's where I went. I went and did uh, jiu-jitsu, started that, and then just slowly became completely obsessed with it. And then went down the rabbit hole of jiu-jitsu, I guess, of just like hopping from school to school, found stapes after that. Um, when I got to stapes, I realized that I didn't know jiu-jitsu. <laughs> when I got there, I was like, I know a little bit now. And then I, when I went there, I realized that I didn't know anything because I was getting my head kicked in, which fascinated me. I was like, oh, this is this is what I need. I don't know. I've got a problem with humility. I think I know everything all the time. So it's nice to be shown otherwise. Um and then kind of been there and just learned off him ever since. And then he gave me an opportunity. Um, when I mentioned road recovery, I told him my story. I was training, I was training him for Cage Warriors a few years ago. Unfortunately, his opponent pulled out on the on the day of the fight. I think he had an eye infection. But throughout the whole camp, I was telling him that every time I came in the gym, like I was pissed. Um, I was off my tits, but I became a master at hideness and I'm an abs- like a master at manipulating people to not see how bad I was. And when I told him, he was like, I never knew. I was like, you've got to know what you're dealing with. Like, that's how well I can hide it. Um, so he gave me the opportunity to run roll recovery. Um, and we're about a year and a half in now. Um, and it's going great, man. It's going really good. It's the, it is the thing I am most proud of. Out of all the things I've ever done, anything in my life, I'm most proud. I'd, I, I, if I can put this hoodie on during the day, I'm fucking doing all right. Like, this means more to me. Any cap badge, any medal, any two it, any story. Because this is like, this is something that, that, that like, I've overcome. You know, like, um, I'm not bound to it anymore. So, yeah, that's the kind of history that to current date. There was a, yeah. um, there's a great little quote that I, um, that I kind of not live by, but, but I love to hear every now and again. I'm not, you know, one of these great speakers. I'm not like a Brian Blessed or, um, you know, somebody that's good at speeches and stuff, you know, Morgan Freeman-esque. But it goes something along the lines of um, you don't need to worry about your past or the future. You should only be enjoying what you're doing now. You should yeah. be in the present moment. Because I have these... I have these um, these moments because i run three separate businesses small businesses do everything myself you know i'm i'm one of those that's one of the reasons why i kind of got into breath work to be honest but um that kind of you know calm myself down and set myself up so i was waking them i still do now like last night waking up at three o'clock in the morning and overthinking stuff you know what's michael gonna say what's he gonna be like never met him before he might be a bit of a weirdo yeah threat threat constant threat yeah. Does he wear pants when he's talking on the phone? Yeah. You can't see it. Yeah. You'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, uh, but, but, you know, I, I'm constantly kind of reliving that a little bit. And another great one that, um, you know, I always forget about. I keep, all, I've got about a thousand things in my notes. I love to cut and paste stuff in and I go back over and maybe post yeah, them nice. and stuff like that. Cause you know, I'm a social media whore. Um, yeah is that treat your life life like a blockbuster movie. You know, you're the star of the movie. Imagine like everywhere you go, everything you do, everything you say, what people see is like the film crew. The film crew are following you as well. And you are the star of your own show. You know, you don't want this film to be shit. You want to make it, you know, something amazing. You know, you want it to be one of those things that people you can look back on like your kids for instance your kids can go back and look at that movie when you're not around and go do you know what that's a fucking amazing movie and that's kind of what i you know i i think about sometimes you know i sit on the sofa like we all do and you get stuck into scrolling through your phone you're like fuck what am i doing 
But I'm like, do you know what? I'm just here. Uh, I've got nothing really else to do. The waves are sheer. I haven't got classes till this evening to run, so I'm, I'm all right. Um, yeah. I could be like going through the computer doing stuff, but all I'm doing is it's, it's like when you go on exercise, right? You, you, you pack your kit, then you start fiddling with it. Then you unpack it, reseal it, waterproof <laughs> it, go back again. And then you're still fucking around yeah. with it when you're in the field and you're doing the exercise or you're on ops or something like that, you know, but it's all there already. You know, you just kind of got to enjoy what you're doing. Um, I guess in a way, that's why I like, you know, doing these podcasts and I make the effort to go and talk to people and chat with people that I haven't seen for a, for a while as well. Um, because it's yeah. just kind of interesting. You get different people's perspectives on things as well. And, you know, it can be, it's going to be exactly the same for you with, with, um, with role to recovery, you know, you're going to speak to lots of different people and it's going to be, a, it's, it's going to be a good and positive mark on you too. Yeah, and I've only realised that in my own recovery, um, like the value of talking to the people, but also having the courage to share your life and your experience with other people instead of trying to keep it to yourself. Like, you know, that whole kind of taking a risk on vulnerability, trying to bridge the gap between something you're keeping inside and sharing that with someone else. That's a powerful process. And like, and that's all we do during the sessions. We do a little bit of jiu-jitsu now and again, and the jiu-jitsu is fantastic, but the chats we have before and like the, the topics we we build on are like I've never experienced anything like it even even in my own recovery we had a one Sunday man where like one of the blokes did so well finally sharing his story he's got 12 months of recovery which is incredible but he's still finding a, a way and a platform and a language to actually express himself very silent just kind of listens really well takes it all in actions of, but doesn't have a way of expressing himself on sunday out of nowhere told his story and just floods of tears came out one of the blokes got up big farmer lad got up give him a big hug and everyone just let him cry for a little bit and he was like i have never done that no one prompted it no one's got any qualifications i don't know what the fuck i'm doing but i think what i'm doing is the right thing to do and just to be part of that i was like if I can be part of this, whatever happens, I'm going to be all right. And I have never had that safety or that peace of mind. I always think something terrible is going to happen. And I also love to uh, punish myself with potential outcomes. Like, uh, because through addiction, you become a control freak and you don't understand the whole the uncontrollables, that, that, is, that isn't making sense to me. I'm not having that. I will control and I'll find a way to manipulate so I can control. It's just like how, you, uh, how bring other people's lives into yours allows you to experience all these, you know, when you hear these quotes and you're like, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. When you say like, you can't control the uncontrollables, totally makes sense. You can believe that intellectually. Intellectually, I was like, yep, Absolutely. I've got a clue you're talking about, though. I have no lived experience of that. Only now, when I hear that again, I'm like, oh, oh, that makes so much sense. Like, that whole lived experience thing is like, is, is what we're trying to, like, drive through people. I could list all the quotes in, in the world that I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, that's stoic as fuck that, mate. But I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, can, re I can recite them. Intellectually, I understand them, but I don't believe them. So now, during this process of real recovery, I'm coming to believe all this stuff that's that's a pretty wonderful process yeah 100 percent agree with yeah. you and we've mm -hmm. got like down down here as well we've got um we've got two sort of like local charities or run both by um former serving marines cool. and uh they they've created like community-based stuff around this and yep. one of them's called RV1, uh, run by yep. a guy called Tom Merriman. Um, yep. Stapes has probably spoke about it quite a bit because that, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and I think Ginger's been up up to um, up to Rochdale as well. Yeah, I think he has. Uh, yeah. You know, in the last couple of months as well, doing doing some little bits and pieces, and um, yep. but they've created a community around like physical exercise. You know, Saturday mornings they do a bit of fears, they have a coffee, they have a chat about stuff. And uh, I sat down with him the other day, so I'm doing uh, an event to bring all of the uh, local jiu-jitsu gyms from around Devon together, you know, in a big sure. open mat. 
you know, I've, I've gone crazy with the name of this. It's called Open Matt Devon Mental. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, when, when I sat down and talk, I was talking to him. So I'm doing it for the Royal Marines charity first. And then the next time around, we said, you know, let's do it for RV1. Nice. And I sat down with uh, Tom yesterday and I just kind of told him what we were trying to do. And he said, yeah, mate, yeah, you know, super up for that. And uh, he was like, you know, the the RV1 thing now has been going for probably about four or five years. He, you know, he's been running it for a while and he's got a big kind of community base there, with which which is amazing. Um, they've done a bunch of courses as well that, you know, uh, are from the military, um, you, you know, and they can kind of uh, pass that over to to like the local people. And, you know, he says he's got like 60 year old blokes, you know, 70 year old blokes coming down when they're doing fizz in the morning. They ain't going to do fizz. They're just sitting there watching and having a coffee. Then they have a, then they have a yeah. chat with people afterwards. There's another guy that does um, Exmouth surf veterans. Mate, I've been surfing for a long time and none of them can fucking surf, but you know, yeah. they enjoy the experience of being in the water, like standing up. Yeah, and man. uh, but it's more of like that community feel of bringing people together and you know, the the jujitsu thing as well. Um, you know, with with role to recovery, I can imagine it's ex exactly kind of the same thing. You spend an hour doing some technique and stuff, you might get somebody into like joining a club or doing something different, or it just might be their little outlet, their little look forward for like whatever the day that you do it on. So, you know, all these kind of things that are, that are happening, they're kind of like the, 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 the after effect of what different people have experienced from yeah, the last, like cool from the last 20 years, which yeah, is like, cool which is amazing. I think. Yeah. I think um, when you uh, experience anything traumatic in your life, the first symptom if, if you will it's isolation right you're like oh for some reason it's built into us to kind of want to withdraw i'll let me work this out this is this is too shameful to share or, or whatever in some way but i think all these projects are um are well, i try to say a solution but bringing people together in a weird kind of almost intrinsically built way humans behave differently right? Even just the act of bringing people into one room, something happens and I can't explain it. I can prove it, but I can't really explain it. Therefore, even the act of bringing people together and then encouraging people to share parts of their lives to find... Once once I heard my story, because I thought I was the only one and I was going mad. Once I heard... So I got sober through uh, a 12-step program. Once I heard someone tell my story... I was like, how the fuck do you know what's in my head? And he, he could finish my story before I'd even started it. I was like, how are you doing that? And he's like, w when I was there, I was on my, I was on my phone because I was like, just distracted, can't really concentrate, so I'm distracted. And he was like, you're here. And he's during the kind of the break. He was like, you're here, because you don't think you're an alcoholic. And I was like, I can't be an alcoholic. Like, do you know what I've done? Like, I think I'm quite a big deal. I've done stuff. Like, I've oh, got no teeth and the, the home, I don't know, I know that stuff. Total, total presumptions and misconceptions. But he was like, and what you're thinking now is you're looking around all these kind of people are and you're judging them all as to why you're better than them. I was like, fuck me. That's exactly what I'm doing. And he's like, because I do the same thing. And I'm 20 years sober. And I was like, what? So when I heard my head and my thoughts transferred through someone else's language, and then he said, I'll help you stop drinking. But I've got trust issues, so I was like, you can't help me, mate. Like, I'm not like you. When I finally give up and realize that you're in a, an unwinnable fight and learn learned the whole surrender, I was like, wow, how much of life have I, like, missed out? I've just tried to solo everything since the army. Before the army, it's a character flaw. I thought it was just me. I had to do everything. I've got to be better than people. I've got, and you get rewarded in the eye for doing that. Like I got ranked quicker. I could, I could do stuff. I could make things happen. So I got rewarded. So I believe that that's the way you had to, you know, lead your life. And now I'm just learning how to kind of unravel all that stuff and let other people in, um, and make well, a, a peace with the past. That's the thing though with, with the military though. You've got to remember this, right? Is that regardless of whether you go through. Um, I was going to be really derogatory then about the army, but I'm not. <laughs> do it. <laughs> Whether you go and do a six week dog shit infantry course to become an <laughs> infantry in the army, or you do yeah. 32 
36 weeks of commando training to become a Royal <laughs> Marines commando. Um, you're, you're being constantly told that you're better than everybody else, regardless of like what regiment you're in. You're always being told that you're better yep. because if you, right. go, if you go into a war situation, you know, you yeah. go into a conflict situation, you think, oh, these lads here are shit. You're in trouble. Yep. So you've got to have that you know, exaggerated confidence. You've got to have that ego where you go, I'm better than everybody else. Yeah. And again, right. this is what, you know, this is kind of what we're talking about. When you come out of the military, your identity is this elitism, right? Mm. You've got, you've got this, you've got this idea and this concept about who you Most are. What, I, do you know what? I wouldn't necessarily call it a chip. Nice. I would just say like, it's an indoctrinated ego that you've got. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you eventually leave, because the older you get, or the older I got, all I realized was that the military was a job. That's it. You're getting paid to do something. Yeah, you might be a soldier and you might be able to, you know, shoot people in wartime or blow shit up or you go and do some call cool exercises, do some mint AT, um, you know, be around your, your buddies and your pals and your oppos all the time. Um but at the end of the day, you know, you come into this world naked and you go out of it naked as well. You don't come in with it with anything and you don't go out with it with anything. But the thing that holds military people above other people is the confidence thing, which then comes yep. down to the ego. But then when you leave and you kind of like you, if you leave and you don't know who you are or you don't have that yep. identity because it isn't, you know, embedded into the military then that's yeah. where it becomes difficult. And which is, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit like you are still, even now, you know, I've been doing my therapy stuff now for what, nearly four years. Yeah. Uh, I've been running my jujitsu academy now for what, nearly two, two and a half. Yeah. And um, I've, I've slowly been being around people and talking to people going, I might, <laughs> I might be better than these people. But I'm not, you know, yeah. everybody, everybody's human. But what yeah. I do have is it's, it's not this, this element of like, I'm better than you. I'm just more confident. I hold myself better. Yeah. Um, you know, I have people that come to my therapy clinic and they're like, you know, little shy people, but then, you know, once you get to know somebody and you get that familiarity, then they, you know, they start to open up again, you know, talking about the stuff that, that you guys are doing with, uh, with role to recovery, when people turn up through your door and they turn up to this group, they don't know anyone. They might know maybe one person, but you know, there's that shy effect, isn't it? Yeah, Whereas sure. like if you, if you and I rocked up to a group, like you're talking about your sobriety um, network is that you probably rocked up there, shoulders back, chest out, sat down there and you're looking around and you go, who are these absolute idiots? And you're like, yeah. And then you kind of, yeah, like you're saying, looking down, look at your phone, you listen to what this bloke's been saying. You've heard it a hundred times before, but you're not actually engaging into any of it yeah. whatsoever. You, you, you're not getting that kind of reprisal from those other people. And then when something clicks inside you, you know, it might take like your, like your guy has said to you, you know, and, he, and he's spilling off your story. You go, you know what? I'm actually no different than anybody else. And actually, the similarity, even though that, you know, I might think I'm better than everyone else, everyone's the same, right? So, yeah, it's it's a real weird concept when you start talking about those things and you're breaking it right down. But when you feel, when you, again, when you understand, because you'll get told early on, it's all about connection. You're like, what do you mean it's about connection? And then you hear acceptance and surrender. You're like, look, mate, can we just get to the, what have I got to do to stop doing what I'm doing? Because I'm in like trouble here, um, and then eventually you're like, oh yeah, the opposite of you know addiction. This is connection because the, the what addiction forces and any trauma forces isolation. Therefore, the opposite of that must be connection. That makes total sense. But it's like, like you you just got to stick it out for long enough to let to let the message in. And I think when you said ego, there a big one for me was I had to let go of my pride. Like that pride where you worship the cat badge at some point is the right thing to do. Um, but how do you transition? Like, 
my linear way of thinking after the military got me in trouble. I did believe things were black and white. And if they are black and white, let me tell you, I can make them black and white. I, I make things happen. Um, but then I realized that that's no longer really served me and it's getting me in a lot of trouble, that kind of way of thinking. And only now, I can't believe it's taken me so long to, to finally learn that things aren't black and white. It's just like, but when you get given a second chance, because I was, you know, I was trying to check out and now I don't, it's weird to think how I could think that ever. It's just wonderful to be given another good, good go at it, another shot at it. And I had a lot of shame associated with my past. Like I didn't want to talk about the army and I didn't want people to be like, wow, you've done all these things. I'm like, don't, I couldn't even stand people looking at me. The shame that I felt about I can show you this CV of accomplishments. I've done things that people can't do, but I fucking hate myself and I can't stop hating myself. So like to not feel that anymore, people will be like in the group, like, oh, you've, all, you've got it all squared away. Like you have no idea how, how bad I was. Like I couldn't even look people in the eye and I've like panic attacks over nothing. I was like, what is happening to me? I haven't got that anymore. And I think like it wants you make peace with your past and make peace with your trauma the freedom it gives you it's unexplainable i still suffer like i have the same things as you wake up and it's like and it's off okay like like so be it like it's a gift and a curse i can make things happen which is the positive side of this curse but also it makes me into an overthinking overanalyzing and a control freak so be it but the freedom that you get when you finally learn to speak about it just telling your story isn't it man Everyone's got a story to tell. We just need help telling it. That's why I enjoy this platform so much sometimes, is you know, it's you never really know what you're going to get from other people. Sometimes they might be quite closed with it because obviously you don't know the other person on the other side of the um yeah. you know, the, the microphone or the other side of the computer There's or whatever. There's no time for that anymore, is there? We haven't got time for that anymore. No, but I also think that it's also um, you know, you look at different types of cultures, it's a very British culture mm-hmm. to mm-hmm be you know um to internalize things you know Being you think reserved. about yeah you think about your parents my grandparents your grandparents you know yeah, yeah. um that that kind of age demographic there is where yeah. you know they just kind of got up got on with it um yeah. but you know that was kind of their life was you know they get up they go to work they come back home they've got the family they've got the kids whatever dinner um, they might go down the pub for a few pints, you know, or, you know, whatever it is. Weekend was for like playing sport, golf, football, you know, and, uh, and, and I think we've kind of, we've, we've, we've acknowledged that we've moved on from it, but I think now because of like technology and stuff has advanced so much, you know, we're able to do lots of different things, communicate more podcasts, audio books, YouTube, TikTok, you know, social media, everything is out there that kind of goes you you've got something to um to 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 resonate with you know to to have compar uh comparability with yeah, and definitely. uh you know w- which is a positive thing but also there's also a lot of negativity that comes with that as well because you're kind of then you're putting yourself on a pedestal where you're um mm. comparing to yourself to somebody that y- you know you don't know you know kim kardashian is a billionaire, right? Well, you know, one of the Kardashians is. But why is Sam Jones that lives next door to me comparing herself to somebody that's made millions of pounds and tries to idolize her, tries to look like her, tries to buy all the clothes that she does? Yeah, the stuff that she, you know, it's never it's never going to happen. So that's kind of like the the negative effect that kind of uh that that kind of comes with that. But going back to kind of like your point about like the ego thing is where and I'm going to bring it right back to jujitsu again. Yeah, do it. I, I love the leveler. I love the leveler of it. You know, even now, you know, I've been a brown belt now, like, like nearly, nearly two and a half years. And, and I've got um, some of my students that come through the gut, come through the door, you know, big fit lads and stuff like that. And it's just like, rah, you know, grizzing, grizzing it all out. And I'm constantly kind of like saying to them all the time, it's like, you know, it's now, it's this age, age age old concept of don't use your strength so much just mm. technique but without strength and technique you're never going to achieve anything but that, it's the whole thing of like it's okay to lose yeah it's just yeah, okay yeah. it's just okay yeah. to lose yeah. 
you don't have to be a hero. Like if you yeah. if you if you tap somebody or you win that competition round, you win on points. Yeah. It, it, does it really matter to anybody? Are all yeah. your mates going to come round you like you just won like a UFC championship yeah. bout? Go, yeah, man, you're a legend. They're not. They're just the time is going to go again, and and it's yeah. just going to kick kick back in again. You know, and that's why why it's such a great leveler, and then it creates that community effect because everybody's in the grind together, and yep. and and that ego then kind of goes from from being like you know, I think I'm better than everybody else to going, oh, I'm not, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. Not, I'm not so good as everybody else, you know, but I want to get there, you know, True. and that's why I think it's kind of a really good transition or translation of um, of things, and why it's really good. With with helping with like the mental health issues and the substance yeah. abuse and all the stuff that you, you know you guys are dealing yeah, with, sure. with 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 to recoveries because you have that that comparison and that kind of like um, what's the word I'm looking for um, you, you have kind of like that inbuilt community where everyone is doing the same thing and has the same feeling from yeah. it. Yeah, we we like to um, at the end of it. I like to uh, do you know what you're saying there about the the potentially the overload of information it can be a gift and a curse right depending on on circumstances it's the same thing after the, after the jiu-jitsu sessions after if we ever do like tough rolls before the next round starts 60 seconds in enough 90 seconds enough i stop the timer and i give the blokes the time to process and talk it through while they're at the heightened emotions and all the kind of emotional thoughts like okay let's go now you're being real and raw what's your problem and he's like him and him and him and I'm like talk about it and trying to guide that in a way that I'm not telling them what to think but I'm giving them a chance to process what's happening to them if we just jump straight the next round and they go in there with that kind of anger and frustration it's like whoa I can't tell the car down I've already lost I've already lost them um or they take off and they walk off the map like like whatever but it's really important that we spend time processing the stuff that happens to us every single day like we have so many different things from waking up to going to bed that happens. We just store them and then they just kind of get stored somewhere back here. It's going to come out eventually. Just those things might take years and years and years to come out. So I, I think it's really important that when, like when I do my classes, we stop and we regularly talk and I don't necessarily conform to the usual way of, of coaching. But I think jujitsu won't keep me sober. The people will, but jujitsu won't. So if I, I can ruin anything. If I go all into one thing, I guarantee him in here somewhere will ruin it because he loves when I go all in. So I've got to find a way to balance all this stuff. And the way that we balance it is, is, is just by constantly talking and constantly processing and constantly guiding people in, in how to express themselves. Men, especially men celebrating men. There's a new thing, you know, fuck the comparison, men actually celebrating men and, Men, men being feeling worthwhile enough to take a risk on vulnerability in in the reward of actually finally being able to express themselves, not just saying I'm angry or I'm not angry. Like, come on, we can do better than that. Like, you're more complex than that. You know, that's why I love it. And Jitsu does that because with this humility side, like you said, someone's always better. Um, a white belt can tackle a black belt. The secret's out. The secret is out. An athletic rugby player can come in and he'll break your arm, no matter how long you've been doing it for. If you're not okay with that, <laughs> you might as well sack it off now, mate. Because it's changing, isn't it? It's changing since I started. It's changed so much. That kind of elusive aura of a different colour belt isn't quite meaning what it used to mean. And we've got to be okay with that. Like, the white belts that I've got who, are, who don't want to fall over. So, First of all, doing jujitsu with these people when they don't want to fall over because they've got a background in rugby is really difficult. So you better get good at wrestling. You're like, oh, come on. Like, we should be doing ground stuff. Like, you've got to put that person on the ground. And if you can't put them on, that isn't their fault. They don't want to fall over. You can't make them fall over. That's your jujitsu's problem. And you're like, how dare you? I've been doing this for seven years. You know, so like, it's the same thing. You relearn that process all the time. Humility, all the time, all the time. And it's changing so much, isn't it? Yeah, since since I started so much, I uh, I kind of I do something a little bit strange, kind of like what you do with. Uh, in fact, going back to kind of your point about what you're doing in between the rounds, mm -hmm. that's 
that's brilliant. I've never heard that before. So I think, I think that's a, a really good tool, something very different. Um, and, uh, definitely can be utilized, um, in, in that kind of environment as well. I'm not sure whether I'd do it in an actual jujitsu class because, uh, well, I suppose you could do really. We can give an opportunity maybe at the end, you know, when someone's blatantly got a problem yeah. and there's, there's a bit of a clash, there's a bit of friction coming up, maybe not there and there because you might get the raw reaction, but at the end you can just, as a way of like bridging that, you're like, I felt a bit of like friction, hostility there. Was everything all right? I just want to give you a chance to talk about it. You're like you should, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have heel hooked me. You said you wouldn't do that. You're like, oh, okay, let's let's talk about. It. Let's not leave on on blood on bad blood. This is just what honesty feels like, and you haven't yeah. got to like. I'm not your boss. I'm not your mentor. I'm just the same as you. So j- just because my belt color is different, it doesn't mean that we're better or worse than each other. Like you said, we're all the same. So let's act that way. Now the round's finished. Let's act that way. Yeah, do you know what? You just made me laugh because I've been there, done that. <laughs> Yeah, man, absolutely. I I, uh, I went to, uh, I'm not going to say who it is. I'm just going to try and keep it as brief as possible so it doesn't <laughs> kind of like put it in there. But let's just say uh, I went to the class and the rules were um, no like heel hooks or leg locks because, you know, people are just starting out. Yeah. So I ended up rolling with this person in, uh, you know, both the same level. And uh, got into leg entanglement. I think it was maybe an Ashgrammy or something like that, maybe. And, um, you know, wasn't going to put a heel hook in or anything like that, but it was there. So I kind of like played with the idea of, yeah, there it's there. Oh, my God, man. He flashed like, well, it just went off, went off the Richter. What are you doing? I was like, oh, you know, really good. We like really good friends as well. And nice. like, it just kind of put that, um, it just kind of put that awkwardity into it. Is that even interesting? Then is it like were you both trying to win? Because if you weren't trying to win, why should that matter? No, you've broken know, the rules. Well, have, have I? Yeah, well, it, it was kind of like that because I didn't like that. That was kind of the thing. I didn't put it on. I was just kind of practicing it because we were like there. But it's like, you know, I'm trying to set an example here, and I was like, that. you know, I've been a PTI for well, I was a PTI for twelve years, right? So, you know, when I set when when you when you kind of set the 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 rules and the the regs for like what you're trying to do whether it's a circuit or something like that yep. i get it i think it was just that over familiarity that just went a step mm. too far and so yeah that was a breach of trust on your behalf or yeah, like a, a little bit. Uh, like a yeah yeah, massively. Like, like I just felt like a right cunt. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But ages after that, and he didn't message me or anything. I was like, oh, mate, I was like messaging him saying, oh, I'm sorry and stuff. And then I went back and trained with him probably about a month later. And, you know, there was, there was, there was nothing said. Like it was probably just me making it all out in my head a little bit. But, um, yeah, yeah, interesting. It, it was, uh, it, it was kind of, it was one of those ones where like, oh, what, what, what have I done? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Have you ever flashed to someone? Have you ever flashed to someone during during training or during rolling? No, 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 no. no. I, I, I'm my whole personality is very passive aggressive. Um, mm. You know, considering where I come from, um, mm. I've I've always had that issue. Like the the majority of my life, I'm that person that kind of looks like he's not bothered about what he's doing, but I'm actually like you know purely passionate about it. You have to talk to me to kind of um, to kind of get that feel. You know, yeah, you're cool. Um, that the, the a really good example of this is when I was in training, like speed marching and stuff like that, or like tabbing, as you want to call it. Yep. Um, you know, I, I'd get I'd get to the end of the march and I'd be shouted at and stuff, and I'd just have this same game face on the whole time. Yeah, I had that problem. Yeah, you're was, not trying. I am. Yeah, I just don't want to maybe see how hard I'm trying. Yeah, exactly. And like it was always um, it was always in my school reports. And um, yeah, good point. That it's not it was, that I don't care. It's that I care too much sometimes. Well, you know, I I think um, a lot of the time, I'm massively digressing here, by the way, a lot of the time, when, a lot of the time when I was in recruit training, it wasn't the fact that I, you know, I I didn't want to, the everything I've ever done is like I didn't, I haven't failed. Yeah, good shout. Yeah. So, I'm not going to fail. I'm going to do everything in my power not That's to fail. So whenever this guy, you know, this section corporal in, in training was like, you're shit, you don't look like you're trying. And then all my reports were like, recruit license could have 
you know, 100% more um, effectiveness if he, you know, looked like he was putting effort in. I was like, what? I kind of am putting effort in. It's like, Mm -hmm. what? Just because it doesn't look like I'm having a shit on my face every time I'm like going for a run or like something really difficult there. I'm just kind of like, (laughs) you know, John Cena, you can't see me. Um, Yeah. yeah, But that's kind of like been through, through the whole of my, my, my life has been a little bit like that where like, and it's only, only over a period of time where people have kind of, um, ac- accepted that a little bit and I accept it as well. You know, I also accept that I could have probably achieved more by trying harder. Um, That's a really good topic we should go on to there. That's a really good topic because the failure and the trying hard to go hand in hand. If I don't try my best and I try within the boundaries, I feel comfortable that you're right. I can't fail because I control the, I control the goalposts. I was talking to only mates, uh, Three power lad who's just started to go under uh, really badly to like to the same point as me, and I won't die this much again. Back at the suicide thing, and we're talking, and he's like, "Nothing I've done means anything. I've always fallen short, and I can relate to that because I think it's a it's a safety um it's like a safety catch for me. If I this is totally truthful, if I know that I can't win this thing, I will not try." Oh, I will. Tr- I will purposely fall short. That was a fear-based mechanism in me since before the army. There's no doubt, but that means that my time or my experience was limited because everything I've done has been based on fear. Like if I can't control the outcome, I don't feel uh, enough courage to truly try my best. Therefore, you get your life and like, have I done anything worthwhile? Like, and only now am I totally sound with failure. I didn't, this is pathetic, I didn't know until recently that if I was getting things wrong, failing, I was learning and I was growing. I I didn't believe that. If you're getting it wrong, you don't know what the fuck you're doing. So you're not, you're not, you fit, you're beyond failure, like you're incompetent. How misguided and like how much I missed out on growth in my early life because I'd never had that mindset. But now, like going back into competition, get me head kicked in and i'm like never mind because the old me were like no i can't take that i can't take that match i'm um um uh, uh something would come up like he looks too good or whatever whereas now anyone gives me a match i'm like yep go on then i'll take it went down to adcc wales got me fuck, got subbed in 16 seconds of a black belt way out my way out my depth way out my depth this guy entered last minute i, I did a quick stalk shouldn't have He's got instructionals out, flew up from the States. I was like, oh my God. But I got there, the matter was like, I can beat this guy. Like, why not? Why can't I beat him? I didn't beat him. But because I had that mindset of like, I can give us a good goal, I got off and I was like, oh, disappointing. But um, not to worry, when's the next one? You know, that's brand new to me. That's a brand new way of thinking to me. That might, I hope that makes sense, but I have purposely fallen short to avoid failure. But yeah, and again, like if we want to bring it back to the jiu-jitsu talk, like, you know, that's exactly what the whole thing is, uh, is about it. You know, if you want to really delve into the weeds of psychology and all this kind of yeah, thing yeah, yeah. Is, the, is the fact that when I, I have people that come up and do free trials at my uh, at my academy, right? Yep. And uh, yeah, I've always wanted to try jiu-jitsu and they come and do a couple of classes, never see them again. And yep. then when I message them back or email them and stuff, or I have a chat with them, or, you know, again, I've got uh, the Royal Marine uh, uh, Commander Trent Center is a mile and a half down the road from my from my house. Wow. So yeah, every, yeah. every now and again, I get some guys that are just passed out of training, they come through. Um, yeah. They've done some Royal Marines close combat, you know, which I was an instructor training for when I was in the Corps. And, you know, really? they do they do a little bit of um, a bit of an armed combat. They come in, cool. they roll with like some normal people. Uh-huh. And then they don't come back again. And you're like, well, I said to one of the lads, I said, you know, where have they gone? I said, oh, they've gone down the boxing gym because jujitsu was too hard. Yeah. And I was like, well, you know, the, the the pastime that we've decided to take for ourselves and 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 um and, and put time and effort into is hard. You know, you've got to be a special kind of weird. I like to say, yeah, for sure, is to kind of enjoy it. But yeah. it is very much that that humbler, that level of like I was talking about before, where you are not going to win every single time. 
you know and like you're saying it's the classic uh john kavanagh isn't it you know if you if you don't win you learn yeah, yeah. you're not going to win everything all the time but the more time that you spend doing this skill and acquiring this knowledge and body patterns and body movement and how different yeah. people react to different situations and you learn that yeah. then you start to get better at something which means that you can be more efficient at it so and that that's when kind of you slowly start to release this this ego and this um this kind of like uh, you know trying to smash people and stuff it's that it's that desire to be the best which is ego for sure yeah and like you say you know not everyone is gonna be a full-time athlete you can have guys that are on the mat that train once a week twice a week but what are they doing it for you know, subconsciously, they might be doing it because, yes, one, it's really difficult. Two, they don't want to do it, but they're making themselves go and do something that's difficult and hard. Is going to be good for them because it's physically active. You're having contact with other human beings and you have to socialize in the point where yeah. my opponent has just basically killed me through a choke. And then afterwards, you're smiling and laughing about it, going, yeah, cheers, mate. Slap that's hand, why it's so face. unique, isn't it? Yeah, and that's, yeah. and that's when I try and explain this to other people sometimes, yeah. it's really kind of difficult to explain it because you could literally like, you know, I could talk about this for hours and hours oh, God, yeah. and hours, but until you physically get yourself, like going to the gym, right? Learn functional movement patterns, whether it's yeah. Olympic lifting or functional lifting or whatever yeah. it is. Going on to, going to in the Jiu-Jitsu Academy and sticking with it year after year after year. You know, the average black belt, 10 to 15 years, you know, that's a right grind there. That's a career. That's a career yeah, and a job, yeah. you know? And yeah. uh, and it's investment in your in your time, and if you invest yeah. in time and your health and your mental health, and it, you know you're working all that sort of thing, it's not going to happen overnight. You know, I say to people, they're not going to be an ADCC champion after one lesson. You yeah. know, it's going to take you know, well, I don't know, yeah, let's say anywhere between seven and ten years to even equate to be any form of level of anything. But again, yeah. that's just consistent. And even then, maybe never. Exactly. But as long as you and enjoy okay. doing what you're and doing okay. and you embrace yeah. the grind and all that sort of stuff, then, you know, that's where we're at, right? I spoke on my fighters um, who uh, just got off the last Cage Warriors and had a terrible start the first round, got his nose broken and uh, lost a lot of blood. And um, when you can see during the fight, he's he's struggling to breathe. His nose is completely bad. He's struggling to breathe. No, nose is pouring. And he's trying to wipe the blood out of his eye. And obviously, he keep his hands up and, you know, do his job. Ends up looking a lot worse than it was. And he had a massive fallout. I hope he doesn't mind me saying it. I had a big fallout of pride. And he was like, what are people going to think of me? Like, that wasn't my best shot. He's come full circle and he's sound now. But I was like, if you never won an MMA fight again, would you still fight? He was like, fucking right. I was like, well, there you go. Like, ego says, oh, my God. Self-esteem says, what are people going to think of me? How can I how can I even set foot back in the gym? But your heart says, yeah, but you're doing this some more than that, right? And you're like, oh yeah, I almost forgot. It's the same with that Kavanaugh thing, like, win or learn. Yeah, man. Intellectually, got you. The question is, do you believe it when it happens to you? So when someone spits the dummy out and they lose, whatever that means, well, you said you were gonna learn off this. Your actions don't look like you're learning. Do we do we believe that now? Or are we still going to have, are we going to have a face off about this, about this uh, almost universal law? Because if you fight those laws, you won't do jiu-jitsu for very long. That you'll have to leave because it'll beat you. Like you can't complete it. <laughs> it's not something you complete. It's just something you contribute to. And you contribute to it by staying involved in it for as long as possible. Isn't it? I was just no kind end. of... I was one of the other things that one of the other points that I just kind of thought of that I forgot to mention there as well is one of the things I do sometimes with um, especially new people or people yeah. that haven't um, are just kind of like drop-ins into into my yeah. classes or open mats um, yeah. you know you take this as you will some people might go what are you doing man but what I like to do is I don't roll 100% with them like yeah. like no, I mean not 100% like I roll like 50% 40% 
And what, what I will do is I will get myself and I'll work myself into a way where they're just going to submit me, whether that's in yep. the first two minutes of rolling with them. And then, you know, they might get me in a triangle or an arm bar or something. And I'll tap and go, yeah, man, that was wicked. Well done. You know, yep. we'll go again. And I'll just kind of like sit on the bottom and I'm, and I'm playing with it a little bit. And, uh, and it, what, what I'm trying to do is I don't want to be, I don't, I want people to enjoy what they're doing. And because I could be one of those guys, right? They come into they come into my gym and I go and train with them and I just fucking nuke everybody. I mean, not that I not yeah, that yeah. I, a bit of an ego thing, right? Yeah. I could nuke everybody. Yeah. But what am I getting out of that? And what are they getting out of that? Yeah, he's you know high end black uh, brown belt, brilliant. He's going to do that anyway. But I'm just going to smash him, or I could just kind of go. I'm just going to work it in the first round. Don't even know him. Yeah. Just tap me. Brilliant. Awesome. I didn't give a shit. That's one thing I've really come to realize now is that I could get tapped by a white belt that's trained for one class, right? Yeah, <laughs> one class. yeah whatever. And yeah. I je- it has absolutely no bearing on my life whatsoever. Yeah. Like, I yeah. literally don't care. Like, I'm yeah. like, that, mate, that's amazing. Let's work yeah. on it. Let's work yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah. You know I've it? just learned that. I can't say I've always done that. I've lost training partners. And, you know, when the roles would start, I'd see people avoiding eye contact because I'm, I'm going for you. Like when I was ill, shall we say, uh, I'd be that person. And I'd just, I'd run out of training partners. I'd have to move gyms to get training partners. Like that's not a credit to me. That's a, that's a, a huge negative against me. Coming back to the gym then and then rolling differently, they're like, oh, like, Thanks for not snap my leg. You're like, hey, no problem. It's all good. Like that was my fault. And I've only started saying, well done to other people. My ego was so huge that if I lost, I'd make it about me. What did I do wrong? Never once given credit to the person who might have done much better. I can't fathom the fact that you might be better than me. So my ego won't allow me to even think that way. Therefore, I've got to justify it by some ridiculous means. And I've only just learned that now. I train with people who are much better than me. I go to a gym, uh, Sub Zone Fighter Academy, and everyone there leathers me. They're all 20 odd year old, up and coming. If they're not, if they're not in Cage Warriors, the Rebellator, or the winning titles at amateur, I get my head kicked in, man. But I couldn't have handled that a few years ago. I wouldn't have lasted. I would have like met force with force. And now I'm just okay with it. And now because I'm okay with it, I'm learning so much more. And now because I'm learning so much more, I'm a better training partner. Because I'm a better training partner and getting more reps, I'm getting better. My jiu-jitsu is getting better. I stopped trying so hard to get better and got better. And just focus on the things that make me better. And you don't get better by winning. Mate, on that note, we've been going about an hour. So, <laughs> yeah, um, man. Yeah, it's flown by, right? Yeah, happy days. Been good. Um, what is, uh, what's the look forward for a role to recovery? What's the aim and uh, what are you looking to do? We've got some good opportunities um, with funding coming up. The NHS have recognised us as a, as a kind of valuable asset to the recovery community. So we're going to try and access that to bring that to more people, make it mobile. Um, just keep telling our stories and te- keep encouraging members to be as open, as vulnerable as possible. So people that see our videos on the internet find connection and bring more people in. Like we're at the stage now where you'll get messages all the time saying, that is me, I'm going to come in. We're just trying to help people actually take that take that leap now, and that's that's our main bit of work. And um, just to keep doing what I'm doing, I am always fascinated. In, I'm not doing enough, and I should be doing more. And it's never enough, but it's never big enough. I'm just content. Like I'm finally fucking beyond better than happy. I'm content. Like I enjoy being alive, and I didn't enjoy being alive at one point. So that'll do me, mate. Like. Wherever this goes, let it be. Like, if I need a guide and steer it, that's cool. But I'm just enjoying living, man. You man, know, it's uh, it's been amazing talking to you, bro. And uh, yeah, yeah thanks, too, th- th- thanks for sharing those things. And uh, yeah, all My the best pleasure. to you. My pleasure. Thank you very much, mate. It's been class. Yeah, cheers, mate. All right, man. See you in a bit. If you like the podcast, please like, share and subscribe on your podcast provider and also leave us a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening.